everyone, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. And we're back after hey. a small hiatus, which is great. And we're going to do this episode and hopefully do, you know, one sometime before next Tuesday, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. And today we're talking about why kids are the worst. Oh, I should probably say who I'm here with. Nope. My name is... Did I say my name already? I'm crushing this. AJ we, Hannenberg, and look, I'm here with... We are out of practice. This has been, been a while. quite some time. Uh, I'm AJ Hannenberg. I'm I know, here this with, is pretty par for the course. <laughs> here with Thomas Magby. Hi. And Graham Donaldson. Hello. And we teach you about ancient things in fun ways. Only fun ways. That's the whole story. That's the whole story. And so today we're talking about why kids can't be good. Good. True. Well, we're gonna, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are actually doing, we're uh, a little bit from uh, Thomas's favorite book of all time, the book that changed his life. It's true. Uh, the Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. And um, so we've been, we did a couple of episodes on Socrates, the, basically the trial of Socrates, and uh, Aristotle was Plato's student, Plato was Socrates' student, and if you listen to our AMA, Aristotle is not invited to dinner, much to my, uh, um, my sadness. Oh, he'd Sorry. be trying to catalog everything. That's yeah. true. That would be great. This yeah. type, there are three types of this dinner. Yeah, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's the noble Good, type. bad. Is, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so we're, uh, I just want to sort of outline for listeners a little bit of the project that Aristotle is trying to do with his ethics. Um, and uh, his Nicomachean ethics, and then kind of also how that feeds into the project that he's doing with his politics. Because as far as Aristotle is concerned, the ethics and the politics are sort of, um, they're handmaidens of each other. They're sort of the same thing. Uh, Once you answer the question of ethics, then you can answer the question of politics. Or then you can sort of, you can figure out what the good city is. Um, So the uh, the Nicomachean ethics, uh, Thomas, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Aristotle, these are just lecture notes. Yep. Can you can you like tell me more about that? I don't know anything more. Oh, like like the, the ethics was that lecture notes? I thought yes. that his rhetoric was. I didn't know his I ethics. I think it's were. the ethics. And so it's a, I thought like, all of it is lecture notes. I don't think so. I think some were written and then some were oh, lecture. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, if okay. I'm not mistaken, it's that these are so uh, Aristotle would give lectures. Uh, that, if only there were experts on the internet who, who <laughs> claimed to have expertise. We're two oh, minutes into <laughs> <laughs> uh, that uh, he would that Aristotle would give lectures and essentially these are the condensed version of those lectures. So we yes. don't have you know, you'll have differences in like the phrasing and maybe some of the artistry of the language, but the ideas are Aristotle's. Um, and so Aristotle with his ethics is trying to answer a question. And that question is essentially, what are people for? Like what's a, what is a, what is a human person for? Uh, what do they do? What is its point? What's, what's the point of a, of a person? Uh, the very famous sort of opening line to Nicomachean ethics book one uh, Aristotle says, every art and every inquiry and similarly every action and pursuit is thought to aim at some good. And for this reason, the good has rightly been declared to be that at which all things aim. So um, everything that exists has some sort of thing that it aims to. Every action does, every pursuit, every inquiry um, has some sort of thing that it aims to, uh, a thing that it's that it's uh, is um, it's sort of shooting for. Um, uh, so, like a hammer, the good of a hammer is to uh, ham- like to hammer and nail. To hammer yeah. and nail. Um, the good of like uh, he says some things like the good of strategy is, or the thing that strategies aim for is victory. Yeah. The things that you know leather making aims for are like saddles mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff, or leather goods. So everything that exists has some sort of end that it's aiming for, the, re, the, the raison d'etre, d'etre mm-hmm. the reason why something exists. And he says, okay, um, what, are, what is the end of human beings? What, are human, what is the telos, which is the Greek word for the end or the goal? What is the end of human beings? Happiness. Yes, exactly. And what I really like about Aristotle, so with Plato before, um, you would have this sort of Socratic dialectic where you would have Socrates always sort of asking questions. And... Um, And Socrates would all, you know, so when we did Euthyphro, Socrates was always asking Euthyphro a question, and Euthyphro kept answering with examples. Mm -hmm. He was like, well, piety is like this, because Zeus did this, and he didn't do that, so that's what piety is. To the point where Socrates gets so frustrated when he says to Euthyphro, I don't want, I don't want any more examples. I want you to tell me the eidos, or the idea. I want you to tell me the core root truth of the thing itself, so I can recognize it in the wild. And so this is the Plato method of talking about things. He wants to know, he wants to be able to know the form of something so that he can recognize it out in the world. Um, Don't give me examples, give me the thing, and then I can recognize the examples. 
Aristotle's kind of the opposite. Aristotle says, okay, human beings, uh, everything has an end. Uh, and he sort of says, um, um, he says, what do, we, what do people say the end of a human being is? If you just like stopped the average dude in the street and you like went to a gym and you saw a dude working out and you went to him and you're like, hey man, why are you working out so hard? And he's like, I'm training for life. And you're like, okay, cool. But like, why? If you kept sort of asking and pushing somebody as to why he's doing something, Aristotle says, eventually you're going to have people that say, well, I'm doing this because it's uh, happiness. I want to be happy. This is the thing that I'm, I'm working towards. Whether they're right or wrong in their methods to happiness, Aristotle says, this is what people do. This is what animates and motivates people. So they, they're doing it because they think it's going to make them happy. And he says, that sounds like the end. He's like, that probably sounds like what people want is happiness. Mm -hmm. And so Aristotle says, okay, so if happiness is going to be our hypothesis, that the chief end of human beings is to be happy, he says, let's put that hypothesis on the table. Boom. Human beings are, are for happiness. And now let's analyze human happiness from a bunch of different angles and see if it fits and jives with the idea, with the thought of it being sufficient for saying it is the end of human beings. Uh, it is the point of human life. And Can I, I, I jump the in. answer. Oh, okay. So oh, if, to human life? No, too. Well, yeah. I, I, as to whether or not they're lecture notes. Mm. Some people say they were the lecture notes of students. Some people say it's much more likely that they were his lecture mm. notes. They were drafts for lectures that he would give, and so they were accessible by only a small kind of circle, and they weren't meant for common consumption of everyone. Gotcha. Because when he, we have some of his writings that did that did exist like that, and they are far more fluent and easy to read. These ones are like his setup for his own lecture. At least some some folks think so. Cool. cool. Um. And so Aristotle says, okay, uh, uh, if we can, let's, let's, sort of, let's sort of posit the hypothesis that human, the, the end of human, of human beings is happiness, that human beings want to be happy. Um, and so then let's, um, he says, what is the science, what is the methodology we're going to need in order to investigate whether or not this is true? Um, and he says that the science we're going to need is, is politics, which is sort of a weird thing to say. Um, whereas if you want, so according to Aristotle, if you wanted to study human happiness and the whole reason that human beings exist, you would go and you would study politics. Woof. <laughs> so poli-sci students out there, uh, uh, you are when you, pursuing, you, you yeah. are pursuing the study of like, the best of humanity. Uh, you bet you didn't think that. Um, and no, uh, what, what does he mean by politics? He, means, he basically means observing human beings in society. Sure. That, that's all he means by politics. He doesn't mean like congressional hearings and... and you know, uh, voting and all the stuff that you probably get in a modern political science class. He means go look at people in community, in the wild, so to speak, and you can be able to identify, and we can analyze to see if this happiness hypothesis fits to be uh, the thing that, that what human beings are for. Um, so he says it's generally agreed to be happiness, uh, but um, there's a problem. And there's a bunch of different sort of definitions as to what happiness is. Uh, he gives three ideas. Uh, this is AJ's joke and dig at Aristotle, that Aristotle is like, well, this, you know, this dinner can be one of three things. It's, always, it's always three types, and <laughs> it comes in this form, in this form, in this form, and that is all the forms. Yeah. Yes. He says um, uh, there are, uh, there, some people sort of give three definitions as to the kind of happiness that we're talking about. One is, are you actually, can you, can you think you guys can guess what they are? Types of happiness? Uh, basically li lives of, l being lives stoked. of happiness. Okay, being stoked. Uh-huh. Being chill. Uh -huh. Yeah. Number three. Being rad. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. How did you How know? Gnarly. Yeah. Or dope. Uh, gnarly and rad and dope, same thing. Okay. Oh, Synonyms. Okay. Um, there are three types of synonym for gnarly rad. No. He says there are three prominent types of life. So like a life of pleasure. Okay, like, life of pleasure is one of them. He says like, some people say that happiness is all about maximizing your pleasure. That's yeah. one of them. Life of duty? Uh, yes. He says that there's, there are some people who say that, um, that life is all about um, um, sort of maximizing one's honor and reputation. You're going to have a happy life if you do that. And philosophy. Oh, nailed it, AJ. Yeah. The last one is the life of contemplation. He's yeah. like, 
We're going to save that one for later. Sure. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, does he, like all philosophers, decide he, that the life of contemplation is the ideal for he men? He does yes. think that the life of contemplation is Sh- going to shocker. be an important part of happiness, <laughs> yes. Uh, but he's got a reason for it. And the reason for it is we're not plants. So we'll, we'll get to that point. Cool. Um, Nailed it. Great. So uh, I think uh, the burden of proof is on you for that yeah, one. That's fair. <laughs> yeah, totally fair. Um, so it can't be, he says, uh, there's a couple of reasons why it's not pleasure. Um, early in the book, he says it's not pleasure because, um, uh, it's, he says, it seems to be superficial. That doesn't seem to be right. Um, and, but later on in the book, he's going to say, uh, only tyrants like pleasure, which is kind of weird. Mm. Um, I'm sort of overstating it, but he says it's pleasure doesn't seem to be the kind of thing we're looking for. Let's see if I can find it. Um, like it goes away, right? Isn't that, yeah, yeah, it goes away and, uh, pleasure does seem to be an end, um, uh, um, is it an end in itself? I don't think so. Is it a means to or, something? No, I don't. Is it a means? No, I think he actually says it is an end to itself. No, um, he says that it is um, sort of this middle category, that there are things that are means to ends that you don't like to do, yep. like working out is a means to an, an end that you to want health. to yeah. health. Um, then there are things that are enjoyable in and of themselves, and they are a means to something else. And he says a lot of the uh, the virtues are like this, that... Um, being just, the man who loves justice when he sees or does justice takes pleasure in it, right. but it is also a means to something higher, sure. which is going to be happiness. Um, and maybe pleasure fits into this. It's an enjoyable thing, but it's also a means to something else. And then there's going to be something that is the end of, it is not a means to something else. It is an end in itself. And yep. he says that happiness is going to be this. Um, we'll talk about pleasure in a little bit later. Okay. Um, so... Where I wanted to camp out is in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 1, Chapter 7. Okay. Um, um, It's my favorite one. Where is it? After Chapter 6. Sorry. Um, He says, if we are going, if happiness is going to be this chief end, so we've sort of had this hypothesis. A lot of people say happiness is the chief end of man. Um, if we're going to posit that happiness is the end of human beings, the, the telos of humanity needs to be something that is, um, unique to human beings. So like the telos, he says, um, um, the telos of a flute is what? what you M- music. To annoy everybody. It's to annoy, it's to annoy everybody. It's to make, you know, beautiful music. Yeah, beautiful the telos music, of yes. a flute is to make music. Yes. And he says that, you know, um, the telos of a flute is different then, or, uh, uh, if you just had like a flute and a hunk of brass, mm-hmm. the telos of the flute is something fluty. It ha- it's something that has to do with its unique flutiness yeah. um, uh, that the hunk of brass can't do. So the telos of a flute is not to use it as like a stick to bonk people with. Mm-hmm. It has to do something with its flutiness. And he says, this is true of human beings. If we are going to find the telos of human beings, it needs to be something that is unique mm-hmm. to the human person. Okay. So he says, we need to figure out what is unique to human beings apart from everything else. And he says, well, it's not okay, pleasure. It's not, it's not going to be pleasure. That's right. So he first, he says. dolphins have that. Dolphins, yeah. You, you, they are giggling. They, yeah, they love to bonk around those, those beach balls. Yeah. That's true. Um, he, says, uh, he says, the unique uh, thing of human beings is not going to be, in the th- is not going to be um, life. Um, life seems to be common even to plants. But we are seeking what is peculiar to man. So life and the ability to reproduce, he says, is not the unique end of human beings. Okay. So the point of mankind is not to propagate himself. Not sexy times. Because plants do that. Okay. Um, which already is an interesting thing. That would be like the Aristotelian answer to somebody who says, human, you know, the re- all of our instincts are just about propagating the human species. And Aristotle says that, like, that can't be the chief end of a person, of human beings, because it needs to be something that is unique to man only. And plants do that and animals do that. Hmm. So that is not the ultimate end. That can be a a end, but it's not the chief end. Sure. Yeah. That gets to a weird... If I was if I was arguing with him, I would say reproduction is the goal of all life, mm-hmm. and then a sub goal would be unique to man, maybe. Yes, um, you would call it the sub the sub goal. Yeah, anything that is particularly mannish mm-hmm. versus any other life, and life is different than flutes. 
Mm-hmm. Like flutes are made for a single purpose mm-hmm. by. So you have an assumption of creation there, I think. You do have an assumption that, that right. everything has one end. Mm-hmm. Right. It has one end that it is intended for and, and designed specifically to that purpose yes. rather than life being the purpose of all life is simply to continue life. And happiness is yeah. maybe like a like some sort of subcategory. Weird offshoot that helps us to or, a, attain or a life. Byproduct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's yeah. arguments against it, yeah. but just just thinking. So he's like, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be like growing and reproducing because plants do that. And he says, and it's not going to be um, uh, the life of perception. He says, next there would be a life of perception, but it also seems to be common even to the horse, the ox, and every animal. So this is an interesting thing. So the idea of, like, perception, um, the best way that I can, I've sort of tackled this is to think of the idea of, um, like, instinct, like, animals act on instincts. Human beings also act on instinct, but we're not going to find the chief end of humanity in, as something that is instinctual because right. that is also common to the animal. Well, and, AJ, this, your, your criticism could also be applied here, too. Yeah, oh, I'm not, I'm not yeah. criticizing. I'm saying, doesn't he kind of have levels of life, and then there's plant, planty life, which mm-hmm. is just growth, yep. and then growth plus sensation, which is, is animal. animals. Mm-hmm. So that's the next level yeah. you're talking about. And then even below plants, there was just like... Mineral. Whatever. Mineral, yeah. like matter Rocks. that just like, like carbon that sits around. Yeah. yeah. Um, he says it's not going to be perception because dogs perceive and humans right. perceive. So the chief end of man is not going to be found in our, uh, in our ability to perceive things. And then he says, there remains then an act of life of the element that has a rational principle. Um... There, this is go- he, so he says the uh, uh, if, if if happiness is going to be the chief end of man, which he which he holds to be, he says happiness is going to be part of mankind's rational faculties. Yeah. Um, it is so happiness is not a sensation. Happiness is not just a perception. You perceive something and like you clap your hands in joy. Um, he says happiness is actually going to be part of the rational faculty of the person. And to really sort of fully unpack this, we probably need to do some, like, um, uh, framing of, you know, classical reason versus, like, the way Enlightenments talk about reason. Uh, AJ, you even just recently gave a talk at the school that was coming, was sort of touching on this. What would be, like, the, how would you frame the quick difference between, like, classical understanding of reason versus, like, the Enlightenment? I think you you have a pretty good idea of what it means, but classical understanding of reason is connected to everything around you, whereas the Enlightenment was trying to divorce reason from everything connected and then sort of rebuild everything from reason alone. Mm -hmm. It was like reason in existence by itself. Yeah. The reason is sort of an isolated thing that we're going to use to try to make, to to like explain everything. Yeah. The project, the Enlightenment project. And the classical idea of reason is. I don't know how to phrase it. Deeply connected to your humanity. Yeah, deeply connected right. to humanity. It's all. It's the seat of morality. Like, like being able to come to moral decisions is a rational thing as opposed to an emotive thing right. uh, for Aristotle. Um, and so when he says, okay, so happiness is going to be rational. It is going to be reasonable. It is going to be, a th- and then he says, it is going to be an activity, something that you can do as opposed to uh, an activity that is done on you or, right. a, or a sensation. Would you say that their perception of ration, rationality was cl- more akin to what we would call wisdom? I think so. Uh, I remember um, this, this may not have any purchase for anybody else, but I remember as, a, as an undergraduate reading philosophy, realizing that when I talked about reason, I was thinking about it in like the Enlightenment way. But when I would say something like, Thomas is a pretty reasonable guy. I was talking about like a practical wisdom in the world right. and if Thomas being reasonable and Thomas being rational seemed, you know, were different in the way that I was thinking about it. And, um, t- saying that somebody who's reasonable, prudent is probably more in line with the idea of reason than math, like the right. logical syllogisms of, of dialectical thought. Yeah. Um, so when Aristotle says, um, happiness is, is, uh, is something that is unique to man and the thing that is unique to man is their rational thought. He's thinking about, yes, being able to do logic, but he's also thinking being able to be prudent and to be wise and to look at the world and to make you know smart choices. 
um, not framing everything around instinct like a dog would, right. um, but being able to be prudent and to being able to be making those sort of rational decisions. Which then might make the connection to politics make more sense. Yes. Right? That, then it's about this right structuring of things, right? Yeah. But then the sort of the real crazy thing is then that happiness ends up – so he spends a lot of time saying that this is an activity. Yep. Reason is an activity that we do. So it is um, – um, and happiness is part of that. So happiness is an activity that we do. Right. We can – and he says, and it is part of the will. You can will to do the activity of happiness, yep. which is a pretty um, – uh, probably a distasteful thing to to the modern ears, which, I don't know, frames happiness as like a feeling or a status or um, um, all of external factors need to line up it's for any chance of being happy. Yeah, it's yeah. a reaction that's totally outside your control. Yes. Right? And yeah. whereas he says, perhaps um, somewhat more in line with Stoicism, that um, – it can. It is an activity of the will that. Or it's an activity that you can do. You can. You can basically choose to be happy. Is what he says. Um, you can't choose how to be happy, but right. you can. Uh, you have to basically conform to what it is. But you can choose to do it. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, and then he says. Um, um, he does have some kind of caveat for like some people have like really really bad lives. Yes, yeah, he'll like get it's to not that. their He's... fault, and it's like, look, just it's, I'm sorry, some people, but everyone wishes they could be happy. It's even, true. even those people. Is that the one? Where, was it he that was like, yeah, some people are just ugly. Yes, yes. He says there's yeah. a caveat. You can't, you can't stop that. He yeah. says be some ugly. people. He says external factors can influence it. They don't determine it. But he says there are some things. He says beautiful people have a higher potential likelihood of being happy, yeah. and uglier people have a higher potential likelihood of not being happy. Right. Um, <laughs> And, and he says, um, if you are, you know, dirt poor and just scraping by, it's going to be harder Hard. to be happy than yes. it is if you are comfortable. Right. And this, this, this makes a lot of sense. Right. If you are living in a war-torn nation um, uh, and there's bombs falling everywhere, that's going to be a harder environment to find this, this sort of rational happiness. Right. Um, but basically, if you, if you hot, you have a, chan- you have a better chance, yep. which, you know. Uh, is not something you're familiar with? Is that not, yeah, I mean, uh, this is not something, yeah, ouch. Woof. You were about um, to make the opposite joke, so no, I just, I was going to make some sort of like Aristotle uh, aristocrat uh, kind of joke about. I saw uh, those gears turning. Um, mm-hmm. This is um, so I said that in class. I was like, so Aristotle basically says that beautiful people have a higher percentage chance of being happy, and someone said, "Based." <laughs> In class, which is uh, really funny. There, we <laughs> talked today about, uh, it's a quote from Picture of Dorian Gray where he's basically like, any intellect destroys the harmony of any face yeah. and smart people are all forehead or nose or something hideous and all the learned men are ugly. And the kids were like, yeah, you can be beautiful inside. And I'm like, well, you kind of proved my point there. Folks. <laughs> and oh, it, was, it was just a fun conversation about smart people are usually dumb and yeah. ugly people are, yeah, it's just... Clearly, it's a stereotype, yeah, but sure. it was a fun conversation with ninth graders. Yeah. Now, and then he's going to connect that. So the rational faculty, the thing that we can do, he says, just like a flute, if AJ, if I gave AJ a flute and I said, hey, man, play this flute, you could you technically play that flute? Probably. I figured out. Yeah. You could technically play that flute. Are you, would you play the flute well? No. Probably not. You Maybe eventually, me. but right at the beginning. I'm, <laughs> Have you ever I'm played the flute? Huh? Have you ever played the flute? I tried once. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. But if I gave Thomas a flute, who is a secret flautist, he's yeah, been exactly. practicing for years, yeah. when he plays it, he doesn't just melodious. play the flute. Yeah. He doesn't just do the talus of the flute, yeah. but he does it well, yeah, with sure. skill. Yeah. And Aristotle says, so too with the rational faculty. He says, there is an excellence of the rational faculty, and that excellence, well, let's see where we have it. Um, now, if the function of a man is an activity of soul which follows or implies a rational principle, and if we say a so-and-so and a good so-and-so have a function which is the same in kind, example, a liar player and a good liar player. Mm -hmm. And so without qualification in all cases, um, eminence in respect of goodness being added to the name of the function, if this is the case, and we state the function of man to be a certain kind of life, and this to be an activity or actions of the soul implying a rational principle, so uh, it is a certain kind of way of living, Uh, is going to be this this um, telos of man. It's going to be a kind of life. It's going to involve the rational principle, that thing which is unique to human beings. And the function of a good man uh, to be the good and noble performance of these. And if any action is well performed when it is performed in accordance with the appropriate excellence, 
So human beings using their rational principle excellently. If this is the case, human good turns out to be activity of soul in accordance with virtue. And if there are more than one virtue in accordance with the best and most complete. So Aristotle um, sort of works to it and he, sa- and he says, um, the right you know, playing of the flute soul, uh, if just to, you know, to sort of use his metaphor, if you're going to play your soul c- with skill and correctly, you, uh, you're going to use your rational principle to its most noble function, you are going to be doing things that are virtuous. Mm-hmm. My kids, when I, when I taught this, and they said, wait a minute, no, playing the rational soul well is not being virtuous, it's being logical. Um, it's be, it's being able like, cause you're using your brain well, right? right? That's what reason is. And I think that's the, the, the hang up between like the more modern enlightenment right. reason and the more classical rational reasonableness, right. um, thing there. Anyway, um, any reactions to that, that, um, uh, the, 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 the activity that is unique to the human person done at its best is virtue. The. I mean, I have a reaction against what the kids said, that it's, it's just simply logic. Yeah. I, I, the activity of logic, if I'm just, say, parsing which table is the best table, is yeah. not going to make me happy, yeah. right? And that, and that was their point, too. It was like, your brain doesn't make you happy, like, your feels. Well, I'm just saying, if the end of reason should get you to the place where virtue is the high, you know, that thing that you should be pursuing. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a difference between working towards something and then knowing that thing, R- ratio versus intellectus. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how much this is interesting or helpful, but I, I just wonder how much of like, d- doesn't virtue just mean excellence? So then isn't, isn't there something of a circularity here of he's saying the person who does a thing excellently is excellent. Yeah. And then, but then he spends the rest of, then he, he moves and he addresses that. So he moves in and the rest of Nicomachean ethics is him talking about the different kinds of excellence. Right. AKA the different kinds Virtues. of virtue that you yeah. can do. And he names the four classical ones. Yeah, of course. Uh, prudence, justice, uh, temperance and fortitude. Yeah. Um, Doesn't he say that justice is the highest and best? Uh, I can't remember. Because it is the action of the other three virtues in regards to other men? I think so. Yes. Yeah, so that sounds, that sounds Aristotelian. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but just to say that, yeah, that um, it, it, listener, if any of this sounds strange, then part of it just could be a language thing. Of, mm-hmm. like, what he's saying is when humans do a thing excellently, that is virtue because that is what the word virtue means. He'll then go on to say what that excellence looks like but I just don't know if the word virtue is like a hang up in some way mm-hmm. because virtue sounds like a moral thing, but then what he'll go on to describe is not necessarily moral. It's moral and reasonable, which I think is the point you've been mm-hmm. making. Um, then he goes on and, and later, this is where he says external goods are needed. Um, it is impossible or, um, for it is, in, it is impossible or not easy to do noble acts without the proper equipment, he says. Um, so it's, it's hard to do noble things if you don't, don't have, have the right sort of externalities capacity. to oh, do it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, um, he, uh, yeah, That's your he point. does leave room for it being possible, but it's going to be real difficult. This is your example of living in a war-torn country? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Or being like, ugly. Yeah, sure. That, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, the hotties have it easier. Sure. Uh, which makes sense. Like, they live in a bubble, a hot bubble. It's easier to be nice. But there's a whole 30 Rock episode about it. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, he says, if you want to test to see if you are virtuous. Well, he basically says you can practice it. Um, um, uh, Let's see. Um, He says, for pleasure is a state of soul, and to each man that which he is said to be a lover of is pleasant. So the things that you love are pleasant to you. This makes sense. This is not controversial. Example. example. Not only is a horse pleasant uh, to a lover of horses and a spectacle to the lover of sights, but also in the same way, just acts are pleasant to the lover of justice. And in general, virtuous acts to the lover of virtue. Um, now, for most men, their pleasures are in conflict with one another because these are not by nature pleasant. But the lovers of what is noble find pleasant the things that are by nature pleasant. And virtuous actions are such. So he says, there are things in this world that are by nature pleasant. And if you are the right kind of person, if you have a noble soul, if you love those things, when you observe them, they are going to be pleasant to you. And so you're going to find pleasure in them. And then that pleasure is also going to be in service of creating happiness for your life. 
So, um, you know, so the example that I gave my students is, imagine in class right now, they have, I teach in front of a big window, and most of the kids just sort of gaze out the window and look at birds, um, and, uh, and the sky. And I said, imagine if we looked out that window at that road, and let's say we saw a little old lady crossing the street to get to Veritas, and then running up behind her was a bumbling seventh grader with a giant backpack, late for class. And he didn't even realize what was going on. And he was swinging his backpack around as he was running. And he knocked that old lady and she fell on the concrete. And he stopped and he looked at her and he looked at his watch and he ran into the school. What we just witnessed would be a shameful act. It is by nature a shameful thing that we just saw. Um, Aristotle is, uh, uh, and, uh, so Aristotle would say, if somebody saw that, and took great pleasure in that lady getting knocked over by the backpack, Aristotle is going to say, eventually, you are going to be in conflict with yourself because you are taking pleasure in naturally shameful things. Um, But then he says, but imagine that same scenario, but when the kid knocks her over with the backpack, um, uh, he goes and he actually, and he picks her up and he, he apologizes and he takes her by the arm and she like pats his hand and he walks her to the front desk and takes her to the front desk and then runs to class. And he's late for class, but he just takes, he just accepts being late. Um, that is a noble thing, what we just witnessed. That would be a good thing. And if you watch that and you took pleasure in that, Aristotle would say that you are taking pleasure in the right thing. And by taking pleasure in the right thing, you are going to be happy. You are going to be somebody whose soul is in harmony with, the, with naturally pleasant things. Sure. And if you aren't, well, then that should be like a signal to you that you need to start loving the good things because you're taking – if you were repulsed by that, you were like, oh, man, what a Boy Scout um, to that kid. Right. Well, then you are actually in discord with what is good in the world. Mm-hmm. And, and Aristotle says you're not going to be happy if you're like that. You might get like temporary stuff now and then, but you're not going to be happy. Um, and then my students said, Mr. Donaldson, would you give that kid a tardy? <laughs> And I was like, absolutely. I was like, yeah, I yeah. give that kid a tardy. Sure. And uh, then I would tell that kid that he wears that tardy like a badge of honor. And the kids sure. were like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so, um, okay. And this, and so that scenario is going to lead us into the next thing we're going to be talking about kids. But any reactions to that? That, um, that there are sort of naturally pleasant things and you are either – you are either like resonating with it or not. And if you're not resonating with it, Aristotle says – You're not going to be happy because you don't naturally love that which is naturally pleasant. What about like ice cream? Naturally pleasant. Pleasures. So we'll get to pleasures later. Yeah. So we're talking just virtue naturally pleasant? Um, uh, Let's see. Does does ice cream escape his definition of something naturally pleasant? No, I don't think so. Because my soul resonates with that, but it might resonate with it too much. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. But he, there, he's going to give a. Uh, ju- Maybe we should talk about pleasure now. He's going to give a justification as to why pleasure is not the same thing as the telos of man. Do we want to talk about that well, now? Let's, let's get there. Okay. You had a whole plan. We'll get there. I don't want to right. foil it. We'll get to there. Go. Right. Um, Go for it. Okay. Um, and so uh, later on, he does. Let's see, does, uh, did I miss it? Yeah. Um, let's see if I can find it. Um, I think Aristotle would be in favor of ice cream. Mm-hmm. I'm, we'll get there, but yeah. I just want, you know, I think he's on board. Now, he, so Aristotle, so students in the class said, well, what about, like, the, the doctrine of sin? That the, the human beings have this, like, sort of natural brokenness to them. Because some kids were like, I would probably, knowing me, I would probably laugh when that old lady fell down. And I know it's wrong, but I would still do it. Um, and they, they asked, does Aristotle have any sort of definition or example of talking about sin? Not really. The closest I could find is he says later on in chapter 13, but while in the body we see that which moves astray in the soul, we do not. No doubt, however, we must nonetheless suppose that in the soul too, there is something contrary to the rational principle, resisting and opposing it. He says there seems to be something in the human person that does seem to put up blockers against purely following the rational principle, which is supposed to resonate with the, the, those things that are naturally pleasant and good. Right. That's the, sort of the closest definition I could get to of, of Aristotle saying that there's some kind of like, you know, um, wrench in the gears of the human person, so yeah. to speak. Anyway, so um, we now have this problem. If you have people that when they observe that lady getting knocked over, they take great delight in it, what hope do they have? Um, well, 
Um, they have to practice the good stuff. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Aristotle says, so this is, so he says in book nine, um, for this reason also the question is asked whether happiness is to be acquired by learning or by hab- habituation or some other sort of training or comes in virtue of some divine providence or again by chance. He's like, okay, so how do you get it? How can you get, if happiness, if, if human beings are made to be happy by means of virtue, which is his definition, if you don't have it, how do you get it? Um, ice cream. Is it, yeah, ice cream. Yeah. Is it, is it um, learning? Can I, like, sit you down and give you a lecture on it? Um, is it by habituation? I teach you habits, like seven ways to be a happy person, and then you just do those habits and off you go. Um, or maybe it's divine providence. God just bonks you on the head with a happy stick, and you are now a happy person. Or by chance, just random chance. It's just like you know, you, you're, the chemicals in your body one day are just firing off. Can I can I make a guess? Go for it. I think it's a combination of divine providence and habituation. Um, you can be divinely inspired to be a virtuous person and come out with an inclination that way, but everyone can be can acquire habits mm-hmm. towards virtue. He says happiness is. The people who are happy are going to say that this it is indeed a gift of the gods. That right. this is a divine thing. And he says, and the hotties are also going to be like, my, my happiness is God-given because God made me hot. <laughs> sure. Um, and so he's like, that's definitely going to be a part of it. Um, but for most of us, it's nice. So yeah. far, so good. The stuff we do. Um, but he, he says that um, it is something, if you are going to want to create happy people, if, you want, if you're going to want to have the potential of a man to be happy, in his, uh, to recognize virtuous things as virtuous and find them pleasant... He says, you, uh, it is much easier to start young with kids. Right. Um, and he says that when you, uh, with kids, what you need to do is um, you need to teach them noble habits. Um, and, and he says, and luckily for us, little kids are naturally compliant and they love to follow orders from adults and they love to be compliant and, and like stand in lines and do things that they're told to. So, so not, not a teacher, this guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's overstating it a little bit, but he is there's like a desire it. for a ritual. There is a desire yeah. for a ritual. Yeah. And like even the little kids, like if you can have the right tone of voice and you can do it in such a way, like kids get super stoked about the thing, doing things together, yeah. right? If you can instill habits in them. And he says, naturally, little kids are compliant. And so you can then instill noble habits in them because over time, as they work these habits, um, it is going to be part of their lives. And then when they're older... Um, they're not even going to know any different. And when they have, when they've taken possession of their own souls to be able to do things, they are going to fall back on the things that they learned and they are going to do those noble habits, but out of their willpower, as opposed to out of their habit, out of their sort of like being automated. And chances are you have a greater chance of those kids being happy. He says, it's not determined, but you have a greater chance of it. Um, he does say that there are some kids that whose souls are so naturally bent towards nobility that even with bad habits, all you have to do is just like insinuate to them, hey, Hanneberg, you would be happy if you were virtuous. And that noble soul would be like, yes, yes, that is the missing piece. Now that someone has just said it to me, and then they go off and live a life of happiness because they were so geared towards nobility that all they needed was that one little nudge and off they go. But Aristotle says most people aren't like that. Um, You've got to to sort of work at making them happy. So um, he says, um, the answer to the question we are asking is plain, also from the definition of happiness. For it has been said, to be a virtuous activity of soul of a certain kind. Of the remaining goods, some must necessarily pre-exist as conditions of happiness, and others are naturally cooperative and useful as instruments. And this will be found to agree with what we said at the outset. For we stated the end of political science to be the best end, and political science uh, spends most of its pains on making the citizens to be of a certain character, um, by means uh, good and capable of noble acts. It is natural, then, that we call neither ox, nor horse, nor any other of the animals happy. Um, for none of them is capable of sharing in such activity. So, let's do, uh, why can't we call animals happy? Because they can't be, they can't do other than 
this instinct. Yeah, they do not have the rational faculties. Yeah. They do not have full perfected rational faculties as a man, as a, as a human person does. Can't call an animal happy. I don't know if I buy that. For this reason also... Yeah, he's also never met dogs. Yeah, yeah dogs For this happy. reason also, a boy is not happy, yeah. a youth. Well. For he is not yet capable of such acts owing to his age. And boys who are called happy are being congratulated by reason of the hopes we have for them. For there is required, as we said, not only complete virtue, but also a complete life, since many changes occur in life and all manners of chances, and the most preposterous may fall into great misfortunes. And then he goes off to talk about um, maybe we can only call someone happy after they've died. But this is, I want your reaction to this. He says, listen, little kids aren't happy, not in the full sense of human happiness. Little kids have not achieved the chief end of man because they do not yet have perfect rational faculties and are doing virtue out of their out of their willpower it's like pretty silly right i mean like my kids are pretty happy uh my i told the story in our ama that we just recorded about my son going to his first wedding and dancing his heart out for an hour and a half and like he he seemed mighty happy but we're talking about different things though isn't that the well wh- maybe well, i think there are virtues naturally practiced by children that get harder as you become an adult that's interesting. Do you want to say which ones? What do you mean by that? Not being self-conscious. Yeah. Not being, and envy is pretty basic. You want a toy and either you get it or you don't, but right. there's not a continuous envious thing happening in kids usually. They don't really know that there's something better out there that they don't have. Yeah. Uh, there, there are certain sins that, that are missing, right? Yeah. They don't really fear men very much. They, that, that makes certain virtues easier to practice for them. It's actually a good point. So maybe the, uh, my kid is practicing uh, the virtues when he's out on the dance floor like that. Um, I, I acknowledge he's not like perfected human reason, which I guess is what Aristotle is getting at. So there's something incomplete maybe in his uh, happiness. Maybe it's a propriety thing that there's an appropriateness to it. For example, if your if your son uh-huh. as a thirty two as a twenty seven year old man also right. went to a wedding and uh-huh. spent an hour and a half staring at the light uh-huh. and just dancing like a goof. Uh-huh. Your pride may not be the same pride that you had at a three-year-old. Yeah, sure. You may actually be maybe a little bit embarrassed yeah. or um, you're like, oh, man, you're never going to get a girl that way or right, whatever, sure. right? right. Um, so there's, maybe there's this idea of propriety, that there are things that are, that are appropriate, uh, to, appropriate a to a child, yeah. but they are not the full perfected happiness of an adult. They are not, they are not the noble qualities of gallantry and nobility uh, in a kid. And that's what he's getting at is that little kids can't, they don't have the faculties to do that. They don't have the faculties to be happy well, in also, the chief end of happiness. I also wonder at his integration of, of rationality into the virtues. Can you practice the virtues and not be real logical? I mean, I, I'm, maybe I'm struggling with differentiating logic from rationality. Is rationality the virtues or is it the practice of logic? Because if it's the practice of logic, I think there are plenty of people who are happy and virtuous and don't, they just know what's right and they do it. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, or even it's like the amount. So like, yes, three year olds have lower capacity than, um, adults. Right. But the, uh, my son's capacity is completely filled by whatever experience of joy he has. So it might be a lesser amount of joy in some cosmic sense, but it fills the thimble that is mm-hmm. the capacity he has for joy. Um, I think Aristotle also has the, the communal aspect to this. Yeah. So your, your son may have 100% of, his, capa- of yeah. his capacity for joy filled, but that 100% is not um, – it's not the same as 100% as a, as a full-grown man with all of his faculties of reason sure. who can do – who is based, frankly, more powerful to be able to enact great wickedness or great goodness. Sure. And, and, and that – aspect of, of happiness, uh, of, of virtue is, is also sure. part of that too. Um, students in my class raised a really great point about what would be Aristotle's response to um, talking about people that had mental handicaps. That's, so like a Down the syndrome person, they were yeah. thinking like Down syndrome people seem, they, they, there is a joy there that is childlike. And the only thing I can think of is, unfortunately, and this is probably uh, um, a strike against Aristotle, is that he would probably say, well, if they don't have rational faculties, they're on the same, right. they're somewhere between perception and pure reason, and that's, and that's right. a lower capacity, and that feels wrong. Yeah, that's, feels, my, that's my beef, that, is, is integrating reason so thoroughly into the virtues. But it's, it's, the reason is, he doesn't just mean, like, again, the dialectic or logic of math. He means um, the, the, the realm of wisdom and prudence. 
But those should, that should point you to the virtues, right? And prudence yeah. is itself a virtue. Right. Yeah, which is going to make you happy. So perhaps I'm getting muddled. Mm. How, is, how is rationality, in, in his conception, different from the virtues themselves? Uh, it's not. It's the practice of the virtues is happiness. Well, that, then, the, then the practice of the virtues can I guess happen it's, even it's, without like those full command of your logical Reason capacities. is the tool one uses to, to be able to make discernment about the virtues. So like know when to be just, know what justice is. You use your rational faculties to do that. Know when to be prudent, know when to be courageous. Okay, so maybe as a child you make, and, or even as a person with Down syndrome, you make mistakes as it comes to virtue and the practice of the virtues that get mm-hmm. you into trouble? Maybe. I don't know. I, get, I, think, I think this is, a, this is a, 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 weak a, a weak spot of Aristotle. That he doesn't have a, um, a framework of... Um, well, he doesn't have the, the, the quorum... De, the, or he doesn't have the made in the image of God. He doesn't have the Imago Dei uh, aspect of that human beings have an, an innate um, dignity to them because of their made in godness, which is true of the child, which is true of the, of the Down syndrome person, which is true of the adult. He sort of says, hey, man, show me those rational outputs. Children, man, you put a kid against like a, a, a rational like knight in shining armor and that knight's going to like rock that kid's world virtue wise. You know, he sort of has this. Kids are crappy adults. But I think he might be... For example, when I was a kid, I had this friend who got me into all kinds of shenanigans that he shouldn't have. And at one point, he was like, hey, let's break the windows on that motorhome your parents got in the driveway. And I was like, I've never seen it move. Sure. So we broke every window on that thing. That was was as bad as a bad bad decision. That was a bad decision. I got in huge trouble. And so I can see that I maybe the the lack of full rational faculties at that point really did cause unhappiness. I right. couldn't be perfectly happy because I, I couldn't avoid breaking the windows because I didn't know I was not supposed to do that. Sure. Mm-hmm. And you then suffered consequence for it. So exactly. your happiness was like cut Reduced. short by the consequence there. So maybe there's something to it. Which is usually the virtue point of like it's you both get to enjoy the act itself and you don't have to worry about consequences. And right? so maybe for the example of dancing at the wedding, uh-huh. I mean, he stared into that light bulb for... Hour and a half. Long yeah, it was, that part was not great. I'm not he, a great parent. It's okay. It's but, fine. I mean, he'll he'll recover. He'll but recover. It's probably not great for his eyeballs, Look, and he probably, probably suffered not. some consequences of yeah, not being well, able to see you know, anything for a little while. He's young. He has time to recover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, so Aristotle from this says. Um, so little kids, we can't call them happy. If we call a little kid happy, it's because we look at them and they're like, oh, they're on the right track, but they're not there yet. Um, yeah. And then he said, and so then moving into politics, he says, so if you want to have, if you want to create. If you want to have the, the highest potential of happiness, you need to create an environment where the maximum potential for happiness can happen. So it's the difference between, like, I want to make fruitful plants by, like, tending to the plant versus I want to make fruitful plants by tending to the environment that the plants are in, the soil. Mm-hmm. And Aristotle says politics is all about tending to the soil, and then you're going to get fruitful plants. Um, so if you can create this society where virtue can be easily practiced. And that means you're not at war all, a lot. Uh, there's sort of enough to go around so you don't have like starving people because it's hard to be virtuous when you're starving because right. um, of those externalities. So he, then he sort of frames the good society is a society that makes it, um, that gives the highest potential for happiness through living lives of virtue to happen. And he says, and the best way to do this um, and the way that you should sort of focus on is education. He's like, you need to go, uh, it is easier to make a child have a higher potential for happiness by changing their habits than it is to, like, talk to adults and try to make them happy by giving them lectures about happiness. Right. Um, so the thought experiment would be, um, if you took a bunch of kids, like a big pile of kids, okay. uh-huh. and you put them in a gym, okay. and you gave them food and water and a bed, and that's it. Mm-hmm. In that gym, nothing else, no school, no books, no nothing, no adults for 18 years. And then you took those kids, that big pile of kids out and you sat them in a classroom and you said, all right, kids, happiness is living lives of moral virtue. Aristotle says you might have one kid in that group that had such a noble soul right. that he was like, awesome. And then went off to be happy, but you're going to have like a bunch of feral kids. He's like, that's not going to work. Right. So what you should do is you need to go and you need to train those kids and, uh, and those kids, uh, and he says, yeah, the best way to train them is to work on their habits. Um, so let's see. 
Um, this is now in book 10, towards the end of the ethics. And this is, we'll, we'll sort of highlight this and then we'll be done. So he says, um, now some think we are made good by nature, others by habituation, others by teaching. So we're back to that question. Nature's part evidently does not depend on us, but as a result of some divine cause is present in those who are truly fortunate. So the hotties. Um, <laughs> while argument and teaching, we may suspect, are not powerful with all men, But the soul of the student must first have been cultivated by means of habits for noble joy and noble hatred like earth which has nourished the seed. For he who lives as passion directs will not hear arguments that dissuade him. Um, And in general, passions seem to yield not to argument but to force. The character then must somehow be there already with a kinship to virtue loving what is noble and hating what is base. He says, when you get them, basically when you get them to be adults, you already need to have souls that are bent and primed towards virtue. Um, And he says, but it's difficult to get from youth up a right training for virtue if one has not been brought up under the right laws. For to live temperately and heartily is not pleasant to most people, especially when they are young. For this reason, their nurture and occupations should be fixed by law. And when he means your occupation is fixed by law, he doesn't mean your job. He means um, like the things you're allowed to do need to be fixed by law. Um, For they will not be painful when they have become customary. But it is surely not enough that when they are young, they should get the right nurture and attention, since they must, even when they are grown up, practice and be habituated to them. We shall need laws for this as well, and generally speaking, to the cover of whole life. For most people obey necessity rather than argument, and punishments rather than the sense of what is noble. He says, all right, if you're going to have a potential of having kids, if you want your citizens to be happy, if you want anybody to have the chance to be happy, they need to have souls that are bent towards naturally pleasant and noble things to take pleasure in those things and then to practice the virtues, which is the highest calling of the human reason, for them to be happy. And the only way you're going to get a bunch of kids to do that is if you create if you create an environment where they have laws so they can only really do noble things, um, and you teach them noble habits, and um, uh, you know. And so, uh, a fun question to ask any uh, high school class is: All right, if you're doing this, okay, according to Aristotle, what do you think a noble habit is that you would teach a child? Um, my students said uh, learning to line up as a kid, like standing in a line. One said brushing their teeth. One said take, you know, being clean. Um, not punching your friends. Not punching uh-huh. your friends. Anyway, so they had a whole list of things. Um, and Aristotle says, yeah, we need to do this because people are, you know, they follow laws more on fear of punishment than they do that they, like, really so you love. you literally have to whip the kids into shape. No, it's not that you whip them into shape. Um, it's why well, it's, there's, there's some I mean, sort of thing. Yeah. There's probably part of that. Uh, he doesn't talk about hitting kids. Oh yeah. Beating them. But I mean, you but, know, force them yes, to punish them. Yeah. He says a lot of people will do things because they, out of fear of punishment, they don't want to get like a speeding ticket. That's right. why they follow traffic laws as opposed to, I've really internalized the like noble goodness of safe driving. Right. Uh, and that's why they drive safely. Um, so Aristotle says, then you need to sort of create these habits for children uh, to grow up in. And then you'll have a shot at having happy adults. Yeah. And, um, and so then, and then, then he ends the ethics and he says, all right, and to talk about that environment, that's the business of the politics. Yeah. And so he's going to move into politics from then. Um, but this is, I mean, a lot of this makes sense that like, um, it's hard, but not impossible, uh, to be happy with externalities. It's hard, but not impossible, uh, to be happy if you have bad habits and if you sort of have grown up with bad habits, yep. um, and um, that uh, uh, um, and that little kids like to follow what ad- like to do what adults tell them to, and so we should. And Aristotle says you should leverage that into teaching them noble habits. Well, my students were like, "Well, that's manipulation. You're <laughs> sure. just manipulating them." And I was, like, I was like, "Yeah, you are. I mean, education. I mean, that, everything. Yes, uh, there, there's a." a subtle difference between manipulation and education. Manipulation has the connotation of being for your ends rather than their ends. Yes. Right. Yeah. Education is when you do things per- perhaps against the insistence of the child for the their, for their good, good. Yes. not your good. And so this is, and Sarah Stiles is like, this is for their good. It is for their happiness. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it is to try to create souls that are bent towards nobility. 
And um, so anyway, so that is essentially uh, the, the bookends of Nicomachean Ethics. That was the first part and then the last part leading in, into politics. And the whole middle part of Nicomachean Ethics is him really looking into what the, what the virtues are and defining them and understanding them. And AJ, I know you know way more about this than I, I do. I've studied two of them, kind yeah. of. Yeah, so you know, uh, literally... I know some courage and I know some justice. Yeah, Good. yes. You're anyway, halfway there. And so that is, that's uh, the sort of the, a little primer on the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, it's not a very readable book. Nope, it's um, a good book. But once you get into the way that Aristotle yeah. kind of like flows and works itself out, there's actually, it's quite delightful. The, um, his, his rigor, I find very enjoyable. Um, and um, there are those little moments where you just have to smile because Aristotle, I like thinking of Aristotle as being like an absolute like, like sort of smug stick in the mud. He's uh-huh. think of him as like a as a snotty person. Right. If you think of Aristotle as like a like a snotty a snotty person that like doesn't watch action movies, mm-hmm. that's you know that's uh, and doesn't drink beer. Oh, that's Aristotle. But is willing to admit that hot people have an easier time. Yeah, he's, he's willing to admit. <laughs> Look, if you're hot, it's just going to be better it's, for it's you. It's just going to be easier for you. Anyway, so that's Nick and Maggie Ethics. Very good. <laughs> oh uh, well, this has been classical stuff you should know. You can obviously find us at our website, classicalstuff.net. You can tweet at us on the twits at CLSSCAL stuff. You can email us at the guys at classicalstuff.net. And you can join our Patreon, which, you know, we love you, Patreon people. Thank yeah. you for supporting us so much. It means so much to us, more than probably you will know. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think that's very sweet. That's probably it. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.